You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And Jared Mounts. Guys, you've been asking for it. You wanted me to talk to somebody from the Maryland DNR. We have the man, the myth, the legend, John McCulloughan. Uh, thank you so much for coming on this show. I really appreciate it. The And we were talking about before the show starts, uh, social media is, is really a bastion for good human conversations. And my comment section has been so well with this nice, neat people uh, displaying their opinions about what's going on on the, on the Potomac. <laughs> and I think, you know, into that, we've had uh, two different biologists from Virginia come on. Uh, you'll be the first from Maryland. And what, what I gather from just talking to you here a little bit and each of the other ones, that what people need to understand, too, that you guys are a couple of things. Number one, you're human. Yes. You're working for the state. But, but most importantly, you guys are outdoorsmen. You guys are anglers. Um, you, a lot of you like to hunt. You, you know, you're even though you're working for the state, you're having to make decisions in the best interest of the whole, you're still, people need to understand you guys are outdoorsmen by nature too. In your spare time, you're fishing and just keep that in the back of your mind. And the idea of opinions, John referred to this too, in an organization, uh, Odenkirk with, with Virginia, that each person within that organization also has opinions. And I've said too before, you know, opinions are like buttholes. Everybody's got one. Yeah. It doesn't make it right or wrong. It's just right. that we've got to be, but what I love that Thomas has been able to do with this fishing DMV too is make this kind of a platform to hear from the horse's mouth, if you will, hear from you about what you are doing in the state because there's what I dislike is when there's a lot of misinformation out there that's not true. It's just based on speculation or assumption and it gets out there and then it's, you know, it's, it's false. And so that's never good. And we're arguing about stuff that's not even true. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Thomas's point, we're glad you, you came out to, to speak with us and, and, uh, today. Are you looking for a really cool marketing opportunity to help grow your business? What would you think if your business logo ended up on every YouTube video we create? Plus, you get a commercial slot for every single podcast. If you're interested in helping support our channel, please reach out to me at fishingthedmv at gmail.com. The email address again is fishingthedmv at gmail.com. And with that said, like uh, for the people at home that don't know you, who are you and what got you into this? Well, yeah, I'm John Mulliken, and I'm with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. And uh, like was mentioned, um, even as a child, I loved to fish. So, uh, you know, I would go to the community ponds. And of course, I didn't have, uh, I grew up in Maryland. I'm a lifelong resident of Maryland, but I didn't have great fisheries close to me. And of course, read all the magazines, but then struggle to catch fish. And, you know, like whenever you struggle to catch fish, you're, is, it, is it me or right. is it the body of what, you right, know, is right. it the lake? And so I was just became interested in, uh, you know, why is one lake or river better than another? Why are some really good and some not? And what can be done, if anything, to make some waters better than mm -hmm. others? So I'm probably one of the few people that even really young, knew what I wanted to do mm -hmm. and knew what I wanted to study. And I went to school to Frostburg uh, University here in Maryland mm -hmm. and was fortunate. Uh, this doesn't always happen, but I was very fortunate that there were some openings for a fish tech. I went to school for wildlife and fisheries because, as mentioned, I'm a hunter and a fisherman. So um, I had both those interests. So I got a, a degree in wildlife and fisheries management. So a double school. major? Mm -hmm. or, okay. And uh, it just so happened that the fisheries position opened. I was right place, right time as, as a technician. And that was in Frederick area. And I've been with the department ever since. I then became a biologist and then a regional manager. And now the field operation manager. So I have the pleasure of working with all of our biologists in freshwater fisheries across our five management regions. So I get to see a lot of different things. And, and we were talking about that before the show. And we mentioned we've had Halliker and Odenkirk. And, and maybe it's because Virginia is like insanely massive compared to Maryland. But it's like what? It's like Odenkirk is like one region of, of right. Virginia. Halliker is another. And you're basically like, saying, hey, good luck. Just do the whole state. Like that's <laughs> that's got to be a lot of well, stress too, right? Well, I, there, we have a lot of good people and, okay. and each we have five management region and each region has a regional manager and then two biologists that work with them to conduct the field work. And we all work together and, and we have some statewide programs. We have a title bass specialist, 
uh, Dr. Joe Love, who's been really great and manages the title bass fisheries. So even though we were, we have five different regions and the, you know, the biologists are responsible for managing those waters within their regions, we're still one division where we work very closely with our hatchery staff. And because we're fairly limited in number, there may be projects or surveys that require staff from other regions. So we'll move around, you know, to get jobs done as required. So everybody really works well together and, and, uh, yeah, it's been pretty effective. And what's interesting too, is that you don't think about it. And again, you look at the map, but you look how close that this, how close we are. Like we're 10 minutes from West Virginia, yeah. you know, we're maybe 40 minutes from Maryland and then you can go another, you know, 20, 30 minutes into Pennsylvania. So, and what I think was intriguing too, is when you get, when you think of watershed and how, or take the Potomac is a great example where you've got shared borders too, Maryland and Virginia and, and, uh, you can have a reciprocal, you know, licensure agreement on there. Um, and so both states are fishing the same body of water. And whereas you may have jurisdiction on the Potomac, you know, how often too, you guys are kind of, uh, I've heard this said often too, you guys are collaborating too with each other from state to state when things come up, like say, for instance, a fish kill or something. Yeah. You guys, I hear that all the time, like, man, you know, so-and-so in this state or whatever, they're really knowledgeable and they're really, they know a lot about that. And you guys are just really doing a collaborative effort too to try to solve a problem yeah and that was something that came up when i was doing um when i was partnering up with iheart radio and they said like why the dmv mm -hmm. is the name it's like because we're so unique where mm -hmm. it's such a because of dc mm -hmm. we're such a community society that mm -hmm. people from maryland and virginia like mm -hmm. you could be in bethesda but you mm -hmm. can be in virginia like five seconds right your activities here like driving is not a big deal for people here. correct it's part of the culture mm -hmm. and so how many people go to deep creek or smith right. or Atlanta to vacation that's like, right probably the three besides maybe ocean city also mm -hmm. i put that but so we're very transient here. yes and so it is all interconnected yes and the potomac is so unique um in the sense that if you type that in potomac river mm -hmm. what comes up is the title right what's so crazy though what is completely overlooked is the upper yeah and that's how right. big it is and how much mm -hmm. fishing is there and that's something i really i mean mm -hmm. i want to hit on really hard is yes. that that it is so crazy and maybe it's just because i'm now on the youtube and stuff and the algorithms but it is. It's a, all it is is the title. That's mm -hmm. all it really comes up. Mm -hmm. And it's such a it's an injustice because mm -hmm. the upper Potomac is amazing mm -hmm. as a fishery. Um, and I just really just just before we really get into into the into the nitty gritty of it, just talk to us about the upper Potomac a little bit, just in general. Right. Well, like you said, it's a it's a border river between uh, West Virginia, Virginia and Maryland. And just from Cumberland, where you have the CNO Canal, which parallels the river, which does provide great access for to the river for you know shoreline or wading anglers, but that's in itself just 160 miles of water. And then above Cumberland, we have many more miles. Uh, basically, that's more of a cold water resource. So the Potomac, because it's the our southern border and, and is so long linearly, it provides good access to just about everyone on the western shore in maryland and it supports a lot of the most popular game fish that anglers pursue so it's not uh it's not really surprising that when we do an angler preference survey that the non-tidal potomac is the most popular freshwater fishing destination in maryland because it's easily accessible to a lot of folks and it's got a lot of the fish that people like to catch uh, you know, primarily smallmouth bass, um, but it also has walleye, musky, um, in the western part has uh, both stocked and wild trout populations. Oh, wild too. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! And uh, so it's 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 really a tremendous resource. And then, like you said, as you get further down, then you get into the tidal waters, which are nationally acclaimed for the largemouth bass fishery. Mm -hmm. So it's really a diverse resource and offers a little bit of something for everybody and easy, easily accessible. So it's, it's very popular. Mm -hmm. I, I really want to like, and you brought this up, let's start with the trout fishing because um, I didn't really know that about the upper Potomac specifically as a trout destination. Uh, could you talk about that more? Sure. They, it's generally called the North branch of the Potomac. And uh, basically what is considered the North branch is everything in the main stem upstream of the confluence with the South branch. So um, basically, if you go to the far western part of Maryland, the far south uh, west corner of Garrett County, okay. which a lot of folks probably haven't been to, <laughs> it's right, pretty right. remote area, beautiful country. Um, but we have some special management areas there upstream of Jennings Randolph Lake. Okay. 
um, we have an area that, uh, well, two areas that are considered put and take. Those are areas that it's called that because we put trout in with the intent that anglers will take them out. And that kind of management is typically in areas where you'll have temperatures that may get too warm for trout to survive year round. We also have a delayed harvest area within Potomac State Forest. Um, and that is where it's stocked and anglers catch and release up until uh, in that area, June 15th. And then it allows harvest because the temperatures would get too warm. Uh, as you move further down, um, you get into Jennings Randolph Lake, which is, again, it's kind of a forgotten lake in a corner of Maryland that doesn't see any of the pressure that that you would get on Deep Creek Lake, but it still has tremendous fishing, it has great smallmouth fishing, um, good walleye fishing. Um, but it's Jennings Randolph Lake and the tailwater downstream of it that provides that cold water uh, to many, many miles of stream downstream of Jennings Randolph. There's an area called Barnum. Uh, again, you remember out cooperation with other states and things. It's I guess Maryland has the jurisdiction there, but there's no access from the Maryland side there due to the topography and the rugged terrain. So access is provided through West Virginia at Barnum. Okay. And there's also several trout management there. There's some catch and release sections. There's some put and take sections. It's stocked heavily, but it also has uh, natural reproduction of brown and rainbow trout. Oh, Interesting. Wow. Um, <laughs> so you have many miles of that until you get downstream to the town of Westernport and its sister town across the river, Piedmont, West Virginia. And then you have a section there that is a... Uh, uh, it's a catch and release or zero creel for trout that goes another 20 miles down to Pinto. And that area is, we did, there is some natural reproduction, but it's also stocked with fingerling trout, which are two to three inches when they're stocked. And then they're allowed to grow and they will look and behave pretty much like wild fish. And it's a really unique trout fishery, uh, specifically for Maryland, because it's pretty large. It requires a raft or, you know, to float. Oh. Um, you know, most, most of our trout streams in Maryland are very small. They're weightable streams, you know, but this one is large enough uh, that it's floatable with rafts and a number of guide services operate out of that area, providing raft trips for trout anglers. And what was that called again? The name of the stream? This is the North Branch. North, 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 North Branch. North Branch. Yeah. Yep. Um, All right. How do you guys, so I remember when we had um, Halliker on and he talked about when they do their, their their studies, there is a lot of trout waters, like between here, PA, like how do you, do you try to do them all every year? Do you have a rotation? Like how do you pick when you do these studies? Yeah, we have kind of a rotation that we decide. We don't have the time or manpower to get every one. Yeah. Certain streams might be, uh, in an area where either on private land or on public land that's protected land that's you know there's not going to be land use changes that may threaten it and the populations are fairly stable they're going to fluctuate as normal populations do um, and those we might sample less frequently because there's not threats to them others that are very important recreationally um, we would sample every year okay some of them um, so, so that's just kind of how, and then we do that across the state. There are certain ones that we would sample every year. And, you know, if they're very stable, um, you know, we can reduce the frequency. What makes you choose? Uh, Cause this is so interesting. I'm thinking about our Virginia guys. What makes you decide like, this is a, a body of water that we should stay up on every year. Is it based on like where people go, where it gets the most traffic? Is there something that you're looking for to make that decision? Well, I mean, we just, know from experience, you know, in dealing with anglers, which ones they prefer, but we also conduct angler preference surveys. Part of managing the fisheries is getting information on the resource itself, but also like, I guess any business would do, you want customer information. What do your customers want? Mm -hmm. Where are they going? What are they catching? Mm -hmm. You know, things like that. So that, you know, combination of those things help us decide you know, where we need to spend our time and where we need to survey to keep up on. Would you imagine that has improved uh, over the years? Uh, like because of the internet, because of technology and phones and maybe apps, do you, do you feel like that has improved those surveys and getting that constituent 
David, yeah, I mean, everybody, David. everybody's lives are busy these days. It seems busier than ever. And, you know, it, it wasn't that long ago, there would be some longtime mm. fishermen that may not have internet or right. may not be, right. you know, True. pretty much everybody a has a phone and a computer. Mm -hmm. And we find that we get a lot of, most of the return is through the internet mm -hmm. on surveys. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's a great way that to get information back from anglers. Gotcha. And that's something that we're doing more than we used to is getting that human component, mm -hmm. getting the creel surveys, getting that, uh, uh, what we call, uh, uh, the, uh, dependent data. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's the fishery, you know, what the anglers are catching. And in the case of the North branch, what we find a lot is that, you know, we get estimates of fishing pressure, and what anglers are catching. And then we've also done population estimates and it's kind of an eye opener. I think anglers would find that uh, populations are not always as high as fishermen think they are. I mean, a lot of times you go out and you think there's a fish behind every rock, but that's not the case. And we, what we found with the North branch in the lower uh, sections uh, that every adult trout was caught twice a year. Really? Wow. So you start realizing, uh, you know, as far as handling, you can have a catch and release regulation, but you know, the fish have to survive that, that experience, the trauma of being caught, right yeah. to, to maintain good fishing. So when you have to recycle fish like that, it's particularly important that, you know, there's good handling and good technique and things like that so that these fish survive. But guys, and the one thing I want to touch on, cause I've gotten blasted by this and, and you said it perfectly. If you don't talk about your local body of water, why would your local DNR care about it? Because there's so many bodies of water and, and it's the squeaky wheel gets the grease. We saw this with the James River. Mm -hmm. Why does Odenkirk, why do they all care about the James? Because it gets so much attention mm -hmm. every single year. And this idea that you want to not talk about your local body of water, then why would anybody want to put more money and effort into right. it? And so you highlighting and talking about it is actually beneficial to it. Because if you just cover it up and no one hears about mm -hmm. it, why would people, it, mm -hmm. it, it's just, there's so much that only a few of you guys can handle each year. And that makes so much sense. But the fishing community is still like, well, we shouldn't talk about the bass fishing here. Um, I did a video talking about Williamsport and everyone was like, oh, you can't talk about that. But it's like, if you don't talk about it, why, if there's no traffic there, mm -hmm. then no one's going to care about preserving mm -hmm. it. I know it sounds weird, but it's just, no. that's the way of the world. Yeah. Very true. I was thinking too, um, I know Virginia does, there's part of their stocking program. You go on their website and they will tell you after they stock, they don't tell you before, but once that stock truck has been there. And of course, I, I think back to back in the day, there used to be a season, trout season, you know, and it came in on a certain day on a Saturday at a certain time at seven o'clock. And then you, you had a season just like hunting season. Um, but the year round has been, I think, very beneficial too for both the fishermen and the fish. Uh, do you all have the same sort of thing where you show or designate when you're stocking certain bodies of water or certain streams? Yeah, I assume you're referring yeah. to trout. And trout, yeah. yeah. Stock. Trout, yeah. yeah. It, it, a lot of states do things a little different. Um, we've had an opening day, and then we have we initially had two closures within the season where uh, the first closure was three weeks, and that was typically in March, and that three weeks was to allow enough time for all the stocking crews to get out and mm. stock everything. The real premise for having the closed season was that when you stock all of the waters and they all open up mm. at the same time, it spreads pressure out. People have to decide where to go. Whereas yep, if you yep. just, you know, if you mm, posted randomly. wherever mm. you stock, then everybody's going to go to the most recently stocked place. Mm. And then a lot of our anglers, we've, again, getting feedback from anglers, a lot of them like the opening day atmosphere. Hmm. Um, like opening a deer season almost. Yeah. Five, yeah. And, and, you know, we've done car counts before and, uh, hmm. you know, you'll, sh you'll show up in an area and people are having a great time. You can smell bacon and eggs cooking and it's some of the ponds and, you know, they've, they've got their spot and it's a kind of a social thing and a big to do. And, and a lot of anglers like that, but yeah. we've tried to, We've tried to, you know, but then on the flip side, you get, you know, some folks that say, well, if you don't have the opening day and I work all week, right. if you stock during the week, fishermen, you know, can get at those right. waters. So it's kind of a balancing act of, of kind of spreading the pressure out and, you know, having that allocation that where everybody can be a part of it. Which I challenge too. I think, you know, it's funny. And I get that because I've been part of that, you know, that opening day stuff, but 
at the same time too, like you're not there, even if you, when you stock, those fish sometimes will not eat right away and they're not still not like anything. They're not going to catch them all and fish are going to disperse throughout the stream. And so, you know, sometimes it is more of a challenge, mm. you know, to catch them maybe two weeks later, three weeks later, but not just as a challenge, they're still there. The fish are still there. They didn't catch them all, you know, so. Right. And the other, yeah. you know, and it, again, things as you, you learn how to approach things over time. We had complaints from some of our larger streams that mm. we stock in the spring that when opening day came, success was poor. They weren't catching fish. And mm. then they would challenge whether or not we stocked those fish. Uh. But on some of these larger bodies of water, you might get, you know, in that early spring period, you get high water. These fish don't know where they're supposed to stay. They will spread. Uh, they right. will move wherever they want and they can move miles. Yes. And so it, you know, so we try and stock those waters closer to the opening day. And what I'm hearing too, again, these they're listening to the complaints and they're trying to make yeah. change. I will. I'm gonna tell a real quick story too, a trout story. So my, I grew up on the Peckin Creek in Virginia, and um, you know, we would have some trout that I don't know if they came down from Isaac Walton or came up from West Virginia, but either way, there was trout in there. And then Dad also took it upon himself and would stock trout. And he was telling me he had one that was growing pretty big. He said, bring your fly rod over and see if you can catch these trout, you know? So I came over and he had video of this. He's up on the bank and I'm, and I caught maybe four, three or four or five, maybe at the most, uh, different size trout. I didn't catch the, catch a big one. And I was tying on different, different flies and working the same little section right there. And after about half an hour, 45 minutes, I would have told you there's no more trout in there. I caught all the trout in there. Well, he would go down and he would take pellets down and feed them when he would mow. And again, I would swear to you, there was no more trout. It's not a big body of water and I've already fished it. I've caught the ones in there. He threw those pellets out there and I swear to goodness, there was like 25 that came up and just like, and yeah. I'm like, what? But in my mind, I'm like, to your point, I'm like, I would have said, oh, there's no more in here. That right. was a lie. Well, we They're hear, in there. But. Yeah. We hear that a lot. And that, that's kind of funny. You mentioned yeah. that, you know, most of us that manage fish and are mm -hmm. biologists are also anglers. Yes. And I hear from anglers that, you know, oh, that's great. You know where all the fish are. You see <laughs> It's not so great. That's it's humbling. Right. That's right. You <laughs> know that they're not what eating. you're not catching. That's right. <laughs> you know, fish can learn and fish, you know, especially yes. in really pressured waters. And, That's and right. in the east and in Maryland, you know, we're you know, it's uh, all of our waters get pressured pretty yes. good. So fish fish can learn to yes. to avoid anglers pretty and that's why i say i challenge anglers too and we talk about even on lakes like they say oh or the river same thing oh you know i challenge you they're in there they're in there just because you're not catching them doesn't or you might have caught more before doesn't mean that they're you know those fish aren't there that's pretty cool that's interesting the trout stamp this is something i really wanted to ask halliker about was the trout stamp in general you're you're buying this stamp to and it does two things one is it's for fun but the other thing is to be able to judge how many trout anglers there are um and this is just me out of curiosity why doesn't that work for other species just to be able to help raise funds for you guys but also get a better gauge because the one issue i've heard about bass guys talking about is like they're not represented it's all about the trout guys mm -hmm. and one argument I, I can see where they're coming from but the other is it's a lot easier to have data points on how many trout guys there are because of the stamps mm -hmm. has that been something ever thought of like figuring out a way to be able to to figure like how many people target specific species? yeah percentage base yeah. yeah yeah well we like i said we do uh angler preference surveys that you know where it'll take from licensed anglers the pool of licensed mm -hmm. anglers and the information that's provided when you buy your license so we know who bought a license and Again, the trout stamp, we know if you're a trout angler, you have the trout stamp, but we'll use that contact information to conduct angler preference surveys where those questions, where we get at those questions, like how many, you know, anglers target bass. And, and like Maryland's no different than it, probably any other state where bass are found, the, the bass, whether they're largemouth or smallmouth, are almost always the most popular sport fish. Hmm. That's what anglers target the most. Um, and then surprising to a lot of folks, but is panfish. Um, really? When you combine like yellow mm -hmm. perch and crappie, crappie are extremely popular with anglers. Mm -hmm. And that's something through the angler preference surveys that in Maryland, we're going to focus more on, hmm. uh, because that's something that we haven't spent as much time on, uh, you know, looking and, and managing for crappie populations. But it's something that through angler preference surveys, panfish are extremely popular. Where can yeah. you, I, I know uh, Jeff Green, Shallow Water Adventures guys, by the way, he's, he's really good. 
he talked about crappie on crappie or crappie, whatever you call them, on the upper Potomac. But besides that, like where else would be panfish waters? Deep Creek, I guess. Deep Creek, upper Potomac. Yeah, Deep Creek is very Deep Creek is one of our better panfish waters. Okay. Um, it, it produces uh, some really nice sunfish and yellow perch and crappie. Uh, so does Rocky Gap. And so we've, you know, we've taken data that's collected on panfish as, as during our bass surveys, and then we're able to look at that data and determine which waters consistently produce the biggest sunfish. And a lot of times that's waters that may not be the best for bass fishing. They tend to have high density, small bass, you know, high density populations with smaller fish. And because you have the higher density bass populations, they're cropping down the sunfish and the remaining sunfish grow faster and you end up with bigger sunfish. So there may be opportunities to manage Interesting. certain reservoirs that, that kind of tend to favor that, that uh, combination to, to manage those four sunfish. And that is, and that, and that got me thinking too. And I, I just was sitting here thinking about the whole idea of management and the difference between trout. Cause I always, always used to think to, or wonder like proportionally are, are, are our dollars, taxpayer dollars or, or licensure spent, is it proportional to the angling experience or whatever? So, but, but there's also people that cross over. I can remember I'll fish for small mouth, I'll fish for large mouth, I'll go trout fishing. So you have that too. But also then thought about it too, when you think about it, most of your smallmouth and largemouth populations, a lot of these, a lot of the fish are naturally reproducing. Whereas the trout, now you have that native trout, but those streams are few and far between as far as, so you have, they kind of, and plus, like he referred to too, smaller bodies of water, plus the warmer temperatures, they're not going to survive in that warmer temperature. So that's why that, that needs to be supplemented because they're not going to survive. Right. The trout, like, say, a right. the trout stamp like, monies is is a lot of that goes to our hatchery program gotcha. to produce Those trout. Kind of but you know, yeah. you mentioned that the, the we do spend a lot of time uh, monitoring and protecting mm -hmm. the remaining cold water resources right. that we have because uh, overall across Maryland, only about six percent of our stream miles can support naturally reproducing trout. Interesting. Hmm. So it's pretty small. And yes. with, you know, changing land cover and, and development and other pressures, um, you know, that there's threats every day right. to that. So we do spend a lot of time, time protecting our yeah. cold water. Which is a resource um, too. I mean, that's you know, the thing we got to keep in perspective. But, but like you mentioned that, you know, one thing that we do find is that, yeah, the, uh, there's a lot of crossover with, ang mm -hmm. with anglers, even wild trout anglers, mm -hmm. you know, they also fish for stock trout and stock trout anglers also fish for, you know, for wild trout and, you know, fly anglers also fish with lures. And, you know, so yeah. there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of overlap yeah, for those groups that's right. and, uh, which is good. And we're, yeah. we're, you know, we're really thankful. But that trying to balance that where they get, where you get in trouble is then you're trying to juggle all these different balls. And then when you get that one person that to say a muskie guy or whatever, whoever that is, that one person that is strictly targeting that, then it's like, you're against the other guy, the small mind or whatever. And that's where, you know, you're talking about the comments. That's where it gets kind of messy because you know, it, it, but it doesn't have to be that way because we're all after a fish regardless of the species. Right. Of yeah. Fish. It certainly serves no one's interest. If right. you're trying to sabotage someone else's Correct. resource, because you think it'll make yours yes. better. And that's where, you know, we collect information on all these fish. We do, the, you know, standardized monitoring. Mm -hmm. And the decisions that we make are going to be based on that data. Gotcha. And, you know, sometimes the data is contrary to what you might even, you know, as biologists, it might uh, be contrary right. to what we thought going in. Uh, so, interesting. Uh, that's a good point. You know, that's why we, you know. That's we, why those numbers and analytics right. are important because, uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. then, it, then it's not a... It goes from not being an opinion, but being based on factual scientific number of data that you're making those decisions. Are in. you just stocking or supplementing the with, with rainbows? Because you mentioned that there is a thriving brown trout population. Is that something that you guys also... Um, we stock in some waters. We, there's several different management schemes that we use for trout. And like I said, it kind of goes in a progression if you have there's a lot of waters where we stock adult hatchery fish and that's put in take with the idea we put them in anglers take them out um that management can happen in seasonally and just about any body of water we we pick bodies of water that 
you know, have adequate parking and access and things like that. But there may be local ponds uh, on the eastern shore or local ponds in the east that wouldn't support trout year round, but it gives anglers an opportunity to do trout fishing where they wouldn't gotcha. otherwise have it. Right. And then there's some waters that <clears throat> uh, reproduction may not be capable of supporting enough wild trout to mm -hmm. meet the demand but trout can survive year round and grow interesting um hmm. and that's what we call the put and grow where we'll stock fingerlings and the fingerlings at a small size they go into the stream they will look and behave like wild trout gotcha. and they provide a tremendous resource and then you have streams that have year-round habitat and water quality and temperatures that allow year-round survival and natural reproduction and a lot of the better waters that are accessible or on public ground in Maryland, those are the ones that are going to have special regulations, usually mm -hmm. catch and return because, you know, the, they're, you just, a lot of those waters couldn't handle the pressure of harvest otherwise. They're fairly small waters and very popular. Hey, isn't there one in Thermont, Maryland? Or yeah, Big Hunting Creek. Big, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's important to know too for because it, it can be very confusing too for anglers just getting into trout fishing. Say, so, oh, you don't want to try my hand at trout fishing. You know, just checking your your now the internet, your website, and mm -hmm. just uh, maps. Virginia does this too, where you have designated trout waters or streams, or like you said, we I even see it where in one given stream you might have a section from this bridge to this right. point that is a catch and release or whatever you want to term term it. And then, or time periods, um, kind of like in hunting, whether when doe season comes mm -hmm. in or when you can shoot a buck or different things like that, just, you do have to do a little bit of research on it. And then it, right. or typically do you all too also post signage on trees along the stream to kind of, we, we generally yeah. post signs at access areas. Mm -hmm. We don't want to overdo it where right. it becomes an eyesore sure. when you're fishing, but it certainly we do at yeah. access points. And we also post signs cause, uh, a lot of waters, particularly when you get into the central part of the state and east, we don't have as much public land mm -hmm. there. So um, a lot of the areas that anglers can fish there are on private property that the landowner has generously allowed anglers to fish. So we post signs letting anglers know their own private property Gosh. and to respect that. Um, but like you said, it can get confusing. Like we, we were discussing the north branch of the Potomac, there's multiple catch and release areas there's multiple put and take sections there's uh, a delayed harvest mm -hmm. section um and again when we do creel surveys that was comments we mm -hmm. take comments from mm -hmm. anglers and that was a comment we received yeah this is this is pretty confusing, confusing. Yeah. so we're gonna do better at posting signs letting anglers know uh you know where those areas are maybe put kiosks up that'll have signs with color-coded maps you know showing where those sections are but we also like you said most the benefit of the internet and a lot of the tools that we mm -hmm. have now and our website is like a lot of the other states there's interactive maps yeah we have an angler access interactive map we have a trout fishing page that has a map of trout management areas that you can click mm -hmm. on and it'll tell you what the boundaries are and you can see it on the map so there's a lot of information on our web page if anglers mm -hmm. go to it that yeah, they can get. A we have a, you know, an angler access map. We have the trout stocking map. Um, we have an angler's log that anglers can uh, report their catches and have pictures and where, you know, and if you kind of peruse through that, you'll see where people are catching different fish. If you're, you know, interested in pickerel, you can kind right. of search it for pickerel and see where people are catching pickerel. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of resources now mm -hmm. available to fishermen that weren't there years right. ago. So right. if you do a little homework, you can really find a lot of information. Correct. And and even if you, you know, if you get to that point and and you still have more questions, uh, also on our website is the contact information for each of our management regions and mm -hmm. again we're fishermen we're happy to that's cool we're happy to point you in the right direction yeah. and guys all this will be linked in the episode description below that way you can find all those resources you can explore it yourself um and do some due diligence musky like well uh, you know i want to tie a bow on that w with the introduction and then i'm going to tie this into the other fun topic of the day i've heard people talk about with with the musky that this was introduced by the state um and so for better or worse a predator was introduced but then on the flip side with the flathead, we have another predator that was introduced. 
but one's fine and one's not. Like, I, I really want to talk about this whole situation with with why why the musky were introduced, the pros and cons of them being inter- being brought into the system, and then also we're gonna have to finally attack this nut, the flatheads. So wherever you want to start with with this hot okay. issue. <laughs> well, <laughs> the the musky population in the Potomac now we have one muscalunge population in the state and that's in the non-tidal Potomac. It's a totally self-sustaining population. We didn't introduce it. We didn't mm-hmm. stock them. We right. never put them there. Now, we, for years, we did have a stocking program using tiger muskies, which is a sterile hybrid cross between a northern pike and a muskie. We stocked those for a number of years, and we noticed there were also, even when I first started and before we stocked tiger muskie in the river, um, we would occasionally collect an adult true muskie. So they were there before we started stocking the the tiger muskies, but very, very low abundance. Um, The survival of tiger muskies is generally wherever they're stocked is pretty poor. Hmm. So we didn't get a lot of return for that, but there were some and, and they, and it provided a trophy fishery, another sport fish for anglers to target. Um, and at the time we also had extremely, and still do extremely abundant sucker populations. So mm-hmm. again, not all fish, you know, you, people see a mouthful of teeth and they think it's right. going to target small mouth right. and not that, you know, any predator, they're all opportunistic, right? but muskies <clears throat> in general prefer longer cylindrical soft grade fish. So mm. suckers, that's primarily suckers, fall fish. That's what they're going to mm-hmm. target. Um, and so what we noticed over time is that the natural uh, muskies were reproducing. We would get some young of year fish that were not tiger muskies. Interesting. Eventually, uh, we discontinued stocking tiger muskie altogether. Mm-hmm. And the fishery naturally expanded. Um, we don't know what the origin of those fish are. Mm. Um, my conversations with a number of different anglers over the years um believe it or not i think it was a bass angler that may have introduced those from uh, you know whatever source he had um and they kind of originated in the clear spring hancock section of the river and from there it expanded but that is something that we did not introduce but we manage now and it's become very popular like you know it's always muskies because of the hours that's involved with Mm -hmm. catching one generally you know, 10 hours on average or so to catch one, it's always kind of a niche fishery Mm -hmm. requires specialized and very expensive tackle. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so it's always kind of a niche fishery. It's never going to be as popular as some of the others. Um, But the Potomac, we now have a niche of anglers that are, you know, and guides that fish for them and target them Hmm. and really, you know, appreciate that fishery. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, that, that's kind of where we're at with the muskie. It's it's got a uh, size distribution that's very attractive. Uh, I think last year, sixteen percent of the population was over forty two inches. So, um, hmm. you know, it it's really a, a great fishery. Um, you you ha- you said something that I really want to highlight was the sucker population and how important. You know, we always think about predators. We don't even think about the bottom of the food chain. You know, if you want big ten point bucks, like you got to make sure that they have corn, oats, and things to eat. Money aside, if money wasn't an issue, is it possible to help with the sucker population through either habitat restoration or stocking programs? Is that something that's even possible? Um, if money probably, wasn't like, well, an issue? probably would have very little effect. I mean, okay. from what we see, and we don't. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of fish in the river, obviously, and our focus is on the game fish, sport fish that are attractive to anglers. So we don't get population data for suckers, but during our adult uh, population monitoring for smallmouth and others, there is an abundance of suckers. They're, they're not in limited numbers. We also monitoring the year class of smallmouth every year. We do seining surveys. It's very similar in design and concept to what the title program does with striped bass, uh, their seining index. And that was initiated back in, uh, uh, the seventies. And it's, it's one of the longest running data sets. And we've recently with some help of the, some of the researchers at Lee town, um, who have the expertise, we looked at this great big data set 
of the seining index. And we not only do we we measure and count the game fish, primarily the smallmouth bass that we collect and come up with a seining index or a, a measure of recruitment, but we uh, we quantify the number and of different species that we get in the seine. So looking at that long term over many, many years, we've seen some changes in the fish community, not probably not so much to uh, of an introduced predator, but because of, of uh, maybe warming, gradually warming habitat and shifts where largemouth bass are becoming a little more abundant in the lower sections, White's Ferries, yeah. Seneca, that area. And, you know, some of the other species like banded killifish, which, you know, some anglers use for bait, those are now spreading, you thing. know, further west. So we see some changes and a lot of those changes have to do with fish that because we've had more high water events huh. recently, the fish that have expanded are the ones that are better able to take advantage of a, uh, a highly variable environment. Mm -hmm. Does the fluctuation in grass, aquatic vegetation in these river systems, that affect also the bait fish populations? And how much does that affect it if it does? I mean, I can't provide a measure of that. I'm sure it does. Um, you know, in in a lot of largemouth environments, you know, they where there's grass, there's bass, as they say, and it provides a lot of cover for juvenile fish. So, you know, a lot of the river, when you have drought low summer conditions and the water is the water is clearer now than it was years ago. So you get very clear water in the summer and very low. And that vegetation does provide great cover and habitat for mm -hmm. a lot of the the other, you know, the bait fish and the forage fish. Well, it's interesting, though. Like I was thinking about Smith Mountain, like because we, we talk about vegetation a lot on here. And it's because it is a, a buffet. It is a, it's, a, it's important for the ecosystem or the fishery as a whole. But then you look at a place like Smith Mountain Lake, you know, Virginia, that doesn't have the grass and that, that can grow big bass or great big fishery population as a whole, striper to everything, you know. So, you know, they will adapt too. Um, yeah, I think it's all percentage and based. Cover and, yeah. and things that yes. will provide other sources of yeah. cover. But in a shallow river, um, you know, there is no other place, place to go. To hide, Less places yeah. to hide. They can yeah. hide under, you know, woody debris or boulders. Mm. But that, that, vegetation does provide uh and it ebbs and flows you know 2018 you know was a high water year throughout the whole year throughout the summer it had higher turbidity and there was also some scouring flows so since then we haven't seen the degree of vegetation that we mm. saw prior to that but it's coming back it's you know that some of that's going to be cyclical and it'll mm. you know it'll come back hmm the big, the, the main order derp, uh, flatheads. Um, I, I'm trying guys on this channel. I really try to keep everybody's, I want everybody to have an opinion. This is a platform that everyone can voice so we can actually communicate and stuff. And I, I've heard certain individuals, I've, I've heard their passionate arguments and I want to make sure we can hear it from the horse's mouth too. Um, I guess let's set the page a little bit. Flathead are introduced. Um, flathead and blue cats are two extremely voracious predators. I think it's a coin flip. David Sikorsky, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation says like the blue cats are a major issue for like brackish water stuff. I'd argue that I think flathead are probably more voracious predators because that's their nature. They want live bait. They want to hunt. Um, and I've, we had Jeff Little on the show and he talked about, he thinks flatheads have killed in his opinion, have killed the Susquehanna. That is it's changed the smallmouth populations a lot. I mean, what's going on with that? Like just, just right. honestly talk to it. Okay. Well, like I said, I, before we, uh, had the podcast here. I looked at some of the, you know, some of the comments from some others. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's, and yeah, I just want to set the record straight that, you know, our department never has and never will stock flatheads. They were not introduced by the department. Um, unfortunately, as you alluded to before, you know, what is an invasive, you know, different anglers may have different opinions of that. And what is non-native isn't necessarily always invasive That's and huge. once a species yeah. Yeah, a once point. a non-native species kind of assimilates into the the ecosystem uh they can become naturalized where they reproduce and they mm -hmm. become naturalized and they you know they kind of fit in over time and when you look at the non-tidal potomac every one of our game fish species that anglers target are non-native yes the smallmouth are not native walleye are not native the muskie are not native 
but they are generally not considered invasive. Invasive is a species that is generally either does or is considered to have a high likelihood of negative impacts to other organisms, uh, uh, the economy, uh, you know, other factors that it's something that will have a negative outcome. And, and there's a lot of variables in these systems that we just don't know the answers to. Um, you know, we've had issues with smallmouth reproduction, both throughout the mid-Atlantic, which has to do with higher flows more recently and high, higher flows in the spring. Also some disease issues with some of the young of year. So your hatches aren't as strong as they used to be. Um, I think some of those impacts could be compounded by having a fish like flathead in the river. Maybe not even the largest adults because the largest adults are kind of almost solitary and they find the biggest, the biggest, deepest, gnarliest habitat with the most cover and things like that, that generally most of the time are not where you'll find the smallmouth, but the young flatheads are in riffles hmm. a lot where you may also mm. find some young smallmouth. Um, we are in the process of getting uh, life history data on flatheads in the river. Interesting. We're getting age and growth data. Um, size distribution data. So it's a little difficult a lot of times to be able to definitively say this species is causing an impact based on information in the literature or in, mm -hmm. in experiences in other states. We could say this one's highly likely to cause impacts. For instance, uh, the flatheads have, have decimated red breast sunfish populations I I was in a bring lot up. of southeastern rivers. Uh, Georgia and, you know, in, in places where that fishery was very popular and now the flatheads have, have pretty much decimated that. Um, so there are impacts. It's hard to say long term what those impacts will be. Um, again, it, it's it, our department, uh, you know, our view on invasives like flatheads and blue cats and snakeheads. There's no creel limit. There's no size limit. Um, in the case of snakeheads, they have to be killed before you, you yeah. know, if you're, if you, we can't force people to kill a fish, mm -hmm. but if you're going to keep it, it has to be mm -hmm. killed. Mm -hmm. And with the catfish, you cannot transport them from one body of, you know, if you load your boat to leave your flatheads, you're, you know, they have to be killed. But, um, so we encourage the harvest of those fish and they're all very good to eat. Uh, which I think the snakeheads would be at the top, mm -hmm. uh, then the flathead and the blue cats are, mm -hmm. you know, they're, if you trim off a lot of the darker meat, the blue cats are very good. Mm -hmm. But like you alluded to on, on a lot of our tidal waters where the blue cats are more common, uh, just the biomass of those fish is incredible. It's, I mean, it, yeah. it is unbelievable how much biomass and, uh, like you said, they are predators, particularly the, the flathead, um, they're a predatory fish. And what we do know from our electrofishing surveys is that their numbers in the non-tidal Potomac have been increasing. And, you know, for instance, Shepherdstown, uh, every five years or so, we have a, a number of fixed sites on the non-tidal Potomac where we do catfish surveys at night in the summertime. Um, I think in 2011, a survey at Shepherdstown, we found no flatheads. And the last survey that was done, um, I think it was 2019, more than half the fish were flatheads. Could, could you repeat that again? Um, How many years separation was that? Was uh, it, was, it was within five years. So a five-year jump. That is insane. Right. So the more than half of them. Wow. And, you know, right now... Uh, you know, depending on how we're not really certain when they were introduced, it may have been over a protracted time period. Sometimes, you know, you'll have they're kind of in the background, and if your surveys aren't tailored to collect that fish, it might be in the background, you don't really see it until adequate numbers are produced, um, where it starts showing up, and then it kind of really snowballs from there. Um, so you know, the 
most of the fish that we're collecting are around 22 inches, but a 30 inch fish is about 10 years old from what we can tell. And anglers have, you know, our surveys again are not geared to the type of habitat where the biggest ones are found, but mm -hmm. the anglers have caught 30 to 40 pounders in the river. So again, we encourage, uh, you know, we encourage harvest of those fish. And what I'm hearing from every state and every biologist and, and you, and across the board, like what is consistent, what we're hearing non-native, like understanding terminology too, nothing really is native, uh, yeah, small mouth aren't, down, but yeah. invasive, like to your point, when that, that goes from vegetation to these different species, um, time will tell in a lot of cases, but what, what is also consistent is what we need to understand as anglers in this resource, we are not to be mother nature or to, to or in our opinion or our mind to think that, well, I like this, so I'm going to put this in this water um, because I like it. And what impact does that have on the entire ecosystem, the ecology of, of the waters? And that's why I think all state organizations take a almost not a neutral but it's not even neutral it's it's we don't want to change we don't want to introduce something else i'm and, and anything from you know even even you know deer or you know elk or you know rattlesnakes you know to kill if you had too many turkey we're going to introduce more rattlesnakes to eat the eggs and then, well, then you have a overpopulation of rattlesnakes you know because i think when we as man try to meddle in that we throw things out of balance and, and I think your all's job is a challenge, um, you know, when it comes to this, because I think what, what's happening is, like they're saying, and Halleker said the same thing, they're not introducing this stuff. Somebody, some man out there is going out there and transporting this and putting it in, thinking it's a good idea. And then what happens as a result is knocking us out of balance. And then we're now we're debating it. And you're all just trying to fix it. Number one, you're getting blamed for it when it right. wasn't you. And then right. you're trying to fix a problem that that one introduction has, you know, caused all these other problems. And, and that that's something like, so when we're trying to gear up our nonprofit, um, that eventually guys, more information will come out on that later on. It's the idea of like, is there anything we can do to help supplement, to help with this? And, and I think, I think that's, I live near Williamsport. I walk my dog there all the time. I fish around there. I fish the canal system right there. Anecdotally. Yeah. The bluegill population has been just shot. Is that something that we can do a, a, a fundraiser to help maybe with the restocking of that, something like that? Because I, I think also, and this is from just what I've seen, it's not necessarily just the flathead that's causing the bluegill de de detrimentation. It's the angler because mm. they go and they catch as many bluegill as possible mm. to use as live bait. Mm. And so it's not just the predator. And this is where in my personal, this is where I think maybe the flathead might be. Now, I think it's fun to catch, but the snakehead, you're not trying to also catch live bait for it. And it operates in waters completely separate. Now, I, mm, I think they both right. should be there. That but the flathead sense. catfish, I've seen people with buckets in the canal system mm -hmm. trying to catch as many bluegill as possible. And it didn't click to me until I started researching how you catch flathead. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh, crap, I think this is why two and two equals four here. Well, I don't know what we could do about that so that everyone can kind of like be in in harmony and i think i mean it, it got me thinking too when you talk about i guess i'd have to look at myself if i was a cat fisherman kind of like like we're big advocates for smallmouth so let's mm -hmm. let's put more smallmouth and let's do that well that's because we're biased to smallmouth so if i was a cat fisherman you know but then i then i go back to it's kind of like you were talking about the trout you know tar targeting the waters where that species like for example the james if you're wanting to go catch big cats and then go to the james there's certain areas and it's also like you said too. Like I think about guys that go up to Erie. The Erie people up there, they they they're not necessarily. They're, most of them aren't into the smallmouth. Mm -hmm. Our guys are because they're smallmouth rats, and they go up there to catch smallmouth. But if mm -hmm. you're from that area, you're looking for walleye and you know different species, pike and different things like that. So anyway, it is an interesting thing. I think um, it, it, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. I mean, but I think again, I think we kind of you know are screwing things up man is yeah, there, by messing some, with mother yeah, nature it, it was a good point you make that there's you know when these fisheries when you when an angler or you know someone chooses to move a fish to another location mm -hmm. which is illegal and uh for many reasons why that we've mm -hmm. already discussed right. so that you know but once that's done and those fish reproduce there's no going back you no. can't Correct. remove you them can't, yeah. you yeah. know, can't they, they are then going to Correct. become part of that ecosystem Correct. that we can try and put controls on it mm -hmm. so that 
you know, to minimize impacts and encourage harvest. But once, you know, once those fish are in mm -hmm. an ecosystem and reproduce. And there's um, examples of like, like the snakehead, for example, we had Odin Kirk on and, mm -hmm. you know, it's like 20 years later, 20 plus years later. Yeah. It hasn't had that detrimental effect that everybody thought initially. And so that one, you know, ended up okay. But not all every situation ends up okay. And, and I, I guess more of this is a, a philosophical question. How do we get back to like a homeostasis state on the Upper Potomac? Is it where, yeah, we maybe just do a fundraiser to do a bluegill stocking to help out with the forage? Is it just we just leave it and eventually it'll go back? Is there something that we can do to help it get back to some kind of like harmony? Well, it, as things change over time, I, I mean, I think it given the size of the resource, I mean, that's something that we wrestled mm. with even when we were deciding the course of action to try and increase catch rates mm -hmm. for smallmouth and go with a supplemental stocking program is, can we physically raise enough smallmouth to make a difference mm -hmm. in the river? And we used the monitoring to target where uh, reproduction or survival of smallmouth had been the lowest and then target that area now we, we couldn't do 160 miles of river and when you're talking about mm -hmm. a forage fish the numbers that you'd need the you know what's in the river the sunfish is the red breast sunfish uh, that is a native species but uh you know their numbers are down we still when we do our seining index we still get good numbers of young sunfish okay. in the same, but we don't see the number of adults. I mean, they can still, enough of them are reaching adult size to reproduce, yeah. but we also have a lot more predators in the river than we used to. So mm -hmm. just stocking additional fish would not really have an impact because of the amount of predators we have now. Um, answering how things change, um, and the Potomac is no different than the Susquehanna or a lot of the other rivers over a long period of time. When you talk to anglers that fished those rivers 30 to 40 mm -hmm. years ago, mm -hmm. they were like, well, we could catch 10 inch trout all right. day long, or I mean, 10 inch smallmouth yeah. all day long. Yeah. And that isn't the case now, but mm -hmm. the, the number of quality size fish is so much better than it used to be. Mm -hmm. Good point. And when we look at our data and we look at over the last, you know, 20 years, and uh, we see that the relative weight, it's a measure of fish condition, mm -hmm. is a lot better now than it was 20 years ago. Interesting. The catch rate of quality size fish is better than it used to be. Huh. Overall, the abundance isn't quite what it used to be. Mm -hmm. you know. And what you're missing is kind of that intermediate size, that right. 8 to 12 inch fish. But we're seeing overall better fish Interesting. Uh, and better fishing. I mean, this spring on the Potomac was the best I've seen. And this summer it's been fishing very well for the summer. Um, so we're seeing, you know, sometimes when you look at reproduction, anglers, you know, a lot of times think the more the better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, mm. that may not be provide the best fishing. Right. So even though we've had some issues that, that are concerning right um overall quality is going up yeah mm -hmm. we are seeing some things with reproduction with some pathogens and mortality from disease and things you know a certain percentage of fish are lost and we've had more high water events if you look at the uh if you look at like the point of rocks gauge and you look at the average flow for may and they've been recording that back from like 1879 and when you wow. look at that there's a lot of noise in the graph but when you graph that out the average flow in May has been increasing. Interesting. Of course, that's the month that bass spawn in. So as the average flow increases, you're more likely to encounter a high water event that's going to impact spawning. So we've seen a kind of decline in successful spawning. But the question is, how much recruitment is enough to provide really good fishing? And, and that's where, and so I've asked Halliker this, Jeff Keeble, Shenandoah River Keepers, and this is just, honest opinion or you don't have to answer it so if you look at the texas dnr tennessee these couple of other ones that are just legendarily known for their their stocking programs and i think texas calls it like supplemental because they're not trying to restock the population when do you think stocking actually has merit and benefits because clearly in some places it does help where you can at least increase the genetic gene pool of certain places i mean in your opinion when is that something that is 
it's plausible. And right? talk specifically to, we found out from one of the other things that you guys have kind of dabbled in this uh, smallmouth stocking, maybe answers yeah, yeah, question tied stocking. into your experience or what you guys are doing currently. Well, doing. we generally, uh, bass are able to spawn in most environments. There usually aren't too many uh, environments where you don't get natural reproduction. Um, the Potomac previously, um, you know, we had more than adequate reproduction. We had high catch rates and low relative weights. And most of the time, these species can maintain a desirable population by natural reproduction without stocking. Now, river fish, river smallmouth, uh, they're going to have a lot of variability from year to year. You might get a flood in the spring one year, which wipes out that hatch, but then the next year you have a good hatch. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's a lot of variation, right. but unless you string together a number of good or bad years, Correct. once you get out five years, because you have average growth rates, but all the fish are individuals. Right. So once you get out five or six years, it bounces out. Yeah, you kind of mm -hmm. don't see the poor year class. Mm -hmm until you start getting multiple poor year Correct. classes. And where we were concerned is we had one of the highest hatches ever in 2007, but then since then, we have not seen a dominant year class. We used to have a dominant year class about every five years or so. So we haven't seen a dominant year class and we've had several years in a row of poor year classes. Mm -hmm. And we noticed that the catch rate decline started to decline we were getting angling complaints too that you know fishing's not what it was the fishing's mm -hmm. horrible <laughs> and you know and then of course when you're you're deciding to do something like that you have to ask yourself well is this a temporary thing mm -hmm. that next year we'll get a big hatch mm -hmm. or is this something that's going to continue mm -hmm. and we need to get on it now right so we kind of looked at the data and decided that you know with declining catch rates and uh, the the lack of recruitment that we had that we would try and supplement the population. And so we started a, 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 a program where we, we used anglers to help us catch the fish because the, uh, we have a lot of skilled river anglers who know how to mm -hmm. catch smallmouth and they know how to catch smallmouth early in the year. And it was most efficient for us to have 30 boats go out and catch smallmouth for us, bring back adult smallmouth. We had our hatchery staff on hand at the, at the uh, tournaments that they held and help decide, you know, with how many females we usually try and have two males per one female. And so we try and identify the fish that we would need. And those would then be hauled to our Manning hatchery in Southern Maryland, where they have ponds set up and they have artificial nesting boxes hmm. with gravel on them hmm, and they're cool. spaced apart so that, you know, each fish has enough room and we'll introduce the fish there and then the fish will naturally spawn on those boxes themselves most of the time the first time we tried it we took the bass put them in the pond all the bass kind of huddled in the middle of the pond and nobody spawned mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it, it was like an epic fail and you know, we're like well we i don't know we should we play soft music or what you know, <laughs> what, you know it was just, they just didn't seem interested that year so you know, so we weird. had discussions with our hatchery staff and like, well, what can we do different? You know, and you consult the literature and you look at what they need and they're pretty experienced of doing this. So they used some ponds that were earthen ponds that they had used for many years. And the next year we got fish and the fish did what they were supposed to do. They went to the boxes, they spawned once they spawn on the boxes and the the, the eggs hatch and the, the fry swarm up. They run a seine through the pond. They collect the adults. Those adults then are hauled back to the river and released where the tournament was, in this case, Brunswick. So the fish were released back in, back to the river. And then the fish were grown in the ponds. A, a portion of those fish were brought inside, trained on artificial food. And a portion were then put into another pond uh, that had Daphne and other zooplankton for them to eat. And the hatchery staff then has to really keep an eye on those fish because once they, uh, when you're mm. raising predator fish like that, once they consume the available food in the pond, they really look to each other mm. and your production starts going down yeah. very quickly. So we were able to, that year we were able to stock uh, about 35,000 
wow fingerling small math out and then we had another couple bumpy years where you know they didn't cooperate and then covid we couldn't operate how we would have wanted to but this year again we had the uh same group of guys held their early tournament at Brunswick. They brought in some beautiful fish for us. In fact, it was some of the best smallmouth catches I've ever like, seen in my entire career on the river. I think wow. we had like was the two winning two? weight were over twenty pounds. I was pounds. Say over, over twenty, 20 pounds, pounds, yeah. yeah. Which we had is, that person on there. <clears throat> right. So that's Rocking. yeah, that was pretty phenomenal. So that's crazy. Those fish, you know, that the hatchery folks, they were, you know, those were the best fish they could ask for. And perfect. The, everything worked out well this year. Last year we had a mechanical issue where we lost fish. So the thing when you're raising lots of fish, something as simple as an air stone malfunction, mm. you can lose a lot of fish very quickly. Mm. And that's what happened last year. Um, but this year we had good success and we put another 38,000 in the river. So this, I want to say too, because this is interesting how this is all transpired because we had gotten word of this, but that was going on thought, you yeah, know, that's a really cool idea. And then you talk to somebody else and they say, well, you know, and again, this is where, whether it be a rumor, a speculation or whatever, well, if those fish aren't, or if they're not putting those fish back in that water they took it out of, well, then what good? I mean, if you're putting them somewhere else, is that really fair for the people fishing that area or that those fish? But again, horse's mouth is telling us that, no, they, those fish, yeah. those breeders went back into that water. And from that experience, you were able to glean a 38 and 35,000 right. uh, that, fish and that you're able to supplement back in with a controlled, what people don't understand too, controlled um, environment. And that's what makes, when he's talking about reproduction, I hear this again across the board, um, that you're a class, low water, high water, you know, wrong time. It's just such, the, a river system is just so versatile and so just, and you can't, we can't control that. Um, but that, yeah. that's that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And we do the same for walleye. It's not uncommon, all states will do that. Right. If they're collecting wild brood fish, we mm -hmm. also do that with walleye in the river. And we do it mm -hmm. every spring because... Um, the situation there, walleye become concentrated mm -hmm. below dam four as they do any other barrier to the river. And that g gives us a perfect opportunity to efficiently go and collect mm -hmm. adult fish for the hatchery. Now those fish, the adults will come back and we also stock about 35 to 40,000 fingerlings in the river, but those walleyes will also supply all of the other uh, stock walleye stocking needs in Maryland from those fish. Wow. If I may ask, just for people at home to understand this, for that one smallmouth stocking thing, from from day one to the, to the time you release, are we are we talking about hundred thousand dollars of a budget that has to be like how much money is actually um, burning or burning? Probably not the best word, yeah. but like going into <laughs> well, doing something yeah, like that. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, I mean, when you you'd have to figure in people's time, and I mean, it's no small expense is it around six figures i i would be or hard for me to say i do know that like uh the first year that we wanted to uh to do the stocking program when the smallmouth decided not to spawn uh we went out and found a commercial supplier that met all of our fish health guideline requirements of testing because we don't want to bring fish all of your our, our facilities are tested but we want to make sure yeah that fish, if they're brought from another facility, also have that similar testing that we require. Um, and the decision was made, well, okay, we failed here, you know, the bass didn't reproduce, we need to get some. So we found a supplier that was in Kansas. Hmm. And, you know, we were able to get 2000. And the cost was about 10,000. <laughs> Yeah, and I can speak to that too. That's what when uh, at a holiday we we were seeing low smallmouth numbers, um, and and through studies we we realized that we found that smallmouth are laying considerably less eggs than the largemouth, and then that you know they are hard to raise. And so John Reedy, you know, looked all over the country, uh, found Fender's Hatchery out of uh, Ohio, who's I think second or third generation. And I talked to him a couple of weeks ago because we're going to do a stocking again in November. And they talk about how smallmouth are really finicky and hard right. to raise and hard to. And so, and he's at a point too, when you're talking about failures, I mean, that's reality too, that it's getting harder and harder. And that's why fewer and fewer hatcheries are doing it. It was so hard to find. And he even alluded to, 
if they get another, you know, poor recruitment themselves and doing that, even in a controlled environment, you know, like they're just going to throw in the towel because it's just not worth it to your point too. It's expensive. It's a lot of time. And so, you know, I think, I think what you're all doing is like, I'm, I'm talking across the, na- the the nation right now that's not done very often. I mean, Virginia, I think is trying to start theirs back up. Uh, but you know, if you're able to, if that's successful, I mean, hats off to you guys yeah. for well, that. Yeah, we, we hope so. These fish will be, um, you know, hopefully we can determine what the, in, mm-hmm. you know, what the contribution of the Correct. hatchery fish is. And we've done that with walleye, you know, any kind of stocking program, you want to make mm-hmm. sure that, you know, because it is expensive and mm-hmm. it is yeah. time consuming and you want to make sure that that money's well spent and that you're getting return for that money. So with the walleye, we have, uh, oxytetracycline is a, a drug that is uh can it's in a bath at the hatchery and you put the fry in the bath for a certain period of time and it will stain the developing otoliths which is an inner ear bone a hardy hard structure and that fish. is brilliant okay. so you can mark a large batch of fragile small size fish that way wow. and then when they're put in the river now when we go and back in the fall and we did the electrofishing surveys we would collect a sample of walleyes that would have been young of year uh, and just for your information the walleyes in the fall are about 12 inches 11 to 12 inches in the end of their first year so we would wow. sacrifice those fish and a sample mm-hmm. of them and then you have to take the otolith mm-hmm. and you would crack the otolith sand it down till you get to that ring where the where that mark is mm-hmm. and using specialized phosphorescent lights it would it'll indicate it'll kind of glow a phosphorescent hmm. to indicate that it was a marked fish and we were able to determine that it, the walleyes that we were stocking in the river we do get natural reproduction but give or take roughly 50 percent mm. of each year class was hatchery fit wow Interesting. so that told us that it is worthwhile <clears throat> it's it is working. contributing yeah. and you know it is providing a good fishery and the so. other thing you're doing too that i think is really important that if if successful like the fact you're using anglers too to help in the process um tournament anglers that are out there fishing they like catching this if they can see and that's what will happen too i think is as you see catch rates go up and they're catching fish and mineral fish and things like that. And they can tie in their mind that, yeah, we helped, we caught fish that you guys were able to take breed and then put back in here. And we're having, you know, we're catching fish and that that's a win-win. That's a win. Plus it, 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 I think it brings credibility or trust, you know, back between the the state and the, the right. We've had great great. cooperation with that that group of anglers in the tournaments. They're well Mm -hmm. run. They, you know, they ask us, what can we do to make sure the fish are, you know, handled well and everything. And, uh, so it's, it's really great. And, and a lot of these, the fishermen will ask us all the time, you know, well, what can we do to help? That's cool. And, you know, that time of year, if we were to electrofish, the water's high, it's cloudy it isn't the best conditions for us to electrofish and right. catch fish. Plus we'd have to cover so much water. Right. It, it's so much more efficient yes. to have 30 anglers go out in 30 mm-hmm. boats and scatter across the mm-hmm. water and bring them back to you and bring them back. Yeah. And they're very good at it. Mm-hmm. You know, we have some really savvy river anglers in this part of the world. And you know, it, you know, there are some days that I've seen the conditions like water was 33 or 34 and yeah. windy. And I'm like, I, you know, I love to fish. And I was like, man, I don't know if I'd want to be out there all day. <laughs> but, you know, and these guys will catch fish. Yeah. And, and if you're putting those fish back in and they're, they're yeah. growing, I mean, that's so, just, that's going to be a win win. I can't, I mean, that's going to overshadow, I think, some of the other oh, yeah. neg- negative things we've been talking about. Well, I think, yeah. And I think, you know, People are connected to it. Yes. They feel like they're doing something. Absolutely. You know, a lot of these anglers, they're out on the water all the time. They're right. catching these fish. Yep. This is something that they've contributed to, you know, and you can go to our website. We have a page for the supplemental stocking, which goes in chronological order, you know, Very and cool. shows all the step, you know, the data that was used to reach our conclusion and all the steps we took, it's the success, the failures, all of that. Very cool. And, you know, and it'll show what we've done. And, you know, I, I've gotten feedback from the anglers that participate in that, how much they appreciate that part of it. Yeah, sure. Because we have pictures there from the hatchery of what transpires that they wouldn't normally see. That's right. We have pictures of the fish on the bed spawning, the, the fry emerging. That's cool. How they put them in, train them, you know, inside on circular 
tanks and they, you know, train some of them on the, on artificial food. So. See, and I think that's important too. And I remember having a conversation with Halliker about that, how, you know, at one point he was able, he was putting a lot of information out, you know, that, that we could watch, whether it be on Instagram or Facebook or whatever videos. And it's very informative, you know, it's things we don't know that's going on yeah. that they're doing. And then sometimes they like, I think bureaucracy, sometimes they want to pull back and then we got to control what the narrative, what's going out there. And, and, I, and I, that's okay. But I think when you get down to the bare roots of this, of, of anglers that are out there fishing on the water and then what you guys are doing and that you bring that together, that, that I think speaks volumes. Yeah. And guys, a link in the episode description to everything that John was talking about. So you can actually go to some of these links. I think it's very informative and, and this is good information for everybody. I mean, the one observation I have is is the nature of the walleye and its movements and because of dam four, does it make it easier to get consistent data points on them because they all bunch up compared to like a small mouth? Does that make it easier or harder? Does it matter uh, at all? Yeah. I mean, small mouth will do, uh, make similar movements and will get concentrate below the dams, but the walleyes will cover a lot of water and, you know, a lot of anglers will, you know, fishermen pick up on a lot of things pretty quick and it's well known that walleyes will gather below the dam in the spring. And so it's a very popular place for fishermen as well. Although all of the walleyes don't go there. There's good walleye fishing for miles downstream of the dam. And, you know, contrary to what a lot may of folks may think, walleye fishing is good year round. Hmm. Um, but because they're concentrated, anytime you have a pre-spawn fish, they're generally very aggressive and they're concentrated, which makes for good fishing. So, but yes, that we're able to get good size distribution data. So, you know, we can see the different size segments in the population. And, you know, what you might find is in what we had before we were stocking every year, we would see very inconsistent reproduction where you might have a big year class that would pretty much carry the fishery for a number of years. Wow. And those fish would get out and out and then you'd have like all big fish, but no small fish. And then, you know, until you got reproduction or were stocking, ideally you want all of the size classes representative in desirable percentages so that it has good fishing and consistent fishing. Because you can, if you don't, if you have very inconsistent reproduction, you may have good fishing this year, but in the years to come, you right. may not. But right. we had, the walleye fishery is, is, is excellent. Um, we also have a regulation in the spring uh, that was enacted many years ago. I can't recall the exact date when it was back in the 90s, I think. But the uh, because of the concentration of fish below there and needing natural reproduction, there's a 20-inch maximum size uh, from January 1 through April 15th hmm. in the non-tidal Potomac. So that basically protects your, your big females. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's, you know, that's been pretty successful that's um, really interesting i didn't know that at all quick quick question i have too is you know obviously we get we we get a lot of ang we have a lot of anglers that when you were talking before a lot of our uh, customers here are fishing potomac upper potomac um and jennings randolph and, and a lot of different bodies of water there so but for people that uh and like thomas was saying you know because of you know vehicles and stuff like there's no like boundaries i mean we, mm -hmm. we will drive to catch fish so with that said, um, can you let our viewers know, like, what are some different sections of the Potomac River that you would recommend anglers fishing? And then also same thing for maybe lakes or ponds or other bodies of water that, that maybe people aren't aware of. Yeah. Well, people are aware of almost everything. Yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, I would, there's, um, you know, for... Uh, I mentioned the trout, uh, the excellent trout fishing mm -hmm. that's up mm -hmm. near Western Port mm -hmm. and that section's up there, up near Barnum. Mm -hmm. uh, then as you, when you get to Cumberland, you'll have, you start, you know, as that water begins to warm, you have the transition to a cool water environment. So smallmouth start to increase. Mm -hmm. And when you get downstream of Cumberland, you have good smallmouth population. You also have some walleye in that area. Okay. Um, and you get further downstream the best areas for walleye are at Williamsport from Dam 5 to uh, get the low head Williamsport Dam below that. So that Williamsport stretch, but the best section for walleye is probably from Dam 4 down through Harper's Ferry to, to Point of Rocks. And is that that's also good smallmouth water too, correct? That's excellent yeah, smallmouth yeah, excellent water. Smallmouth. Yeah, and when you look at smallmouth, you know, rivers, there's, there's kind of a continuum. The further you go upstream, reproduction tends to be a little bit 
stronger. We have greater survival, uh, but the fish grow slower. And you're, and not that you don't get large fish, but the 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 catch rate for the largest fish is basically uh, like from Shepherdstown down hmm. in that okay. stretch. No, though some of the, I, I mean, I have to qualify that some of the biggest smallmouth we've seen in our samples have been in some of the western stretches. So they do grow big fish, but just quantity wise, there's more large fish in the lower stretch. And I'm trying to think, so I know like a lot of the access points are on the West Virginia side for Shepherdstown um, and Dam 4, and then, but you have Taylor's, I think Taylor's Landing there below Dam 4. Big slack you have water. A big yeah. slack. Right, big got... slack water. And, and those are some, you know, you make overlooked areas. There aren't that many overlooked areas anymore, but the big slack water is one that in the summer months is just, it's a lot yeah. of pressure with jet skis right. and water skiing and just other people recreational right. boating. So there's a lot of, if you like bouncing around on waves <laughs> and stuff, that that's a great place. But there is good fishing there. And if you go early, you know, before, you know, there's a lot of activity there, it's good fishing there. And that and that's areas that if you have a prop boat, you know, because it's impounded, you know, there's water 20 over 20 feet deep. You can go up, I think, at big slack water, probably 10 to 11 miles if you have a prop boat, you know, so you can fish that section. The same with the section. If you launch it uh, four locks above dam five, you it's a little bit smaller, but you, again, you have you know, number of miles of water where you can use a larger boat if you have one. Uh, a lot of the other stretches like Taylor's is kind of a tricky ramp. It's uh there's two ramps and they're, they're above and below a riffle mm. and the current's kind of strong there. Gotcha. So uh, yeah, I've seen a lot Careful of people have some difficult yeah. with that. There's Snyder's landing, Snyder, which is right. uh, between Shepherdstown and Taylor's. And, and that's a, a good, if you're going to do a, uh, if you're going to spend a lot of time fishing for smallmouth, that's a good float. Gotcha. Um, there's a, a series of ledges through there. So there's, you know, more habitat, more mm -hmm. interesting water. You tend to get more flat water from Snyder's down through Shepherdstown. Gotcha. It's still good fishing, but it's just yeah. a little different characteristic mm -hmm. to the water. Um, and then, you know, Brunswick, Point of Rocks, those areas of some of the, you know, the best smallmouth habitat in the river. And that's where Jeff's going out of Maine, mm -hmm. I think. But, yeah, you know, it, it's shallow and rocky. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the summertime, you know, it, it, current river levels, unless mm -hmm. you're a really knowledgeable boater mm -hmm. um, or gutsy, uh, right. it's better to float it. Float it, canoe um, or kayak. Canoe, yeah. kayak, raft, whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, just there is some great, mm -hmm. great fishing. What about uh, lakes? Um, there's a lot of good lakes in Maryland. Most of our lakes are either, uh, they're park lakes or water supply reservoirs. Mm -hmm. So most of them have a electric motor only hmm. regulation. Um, there's a number of, uh, like our Baltimore city impoundments, um, uh, Lock Raven is mm -hmm. particularly good for large mouth. Oh, really good. Um, uh, pretty boy is good for large mouth and small mouth Liberty, large mouth, small mouth. Um, those lakes are very good. Deep Creek's good. Um, Rocky Gap is one that has excellent largemouth population, some big sunfish. Hmm. It's an electric motor only lake. The only lakes that you can operate a gasoline engine of any horsepower um, is Deep Creek, the two slackwater areas on the Potomac, and Conowingo. And what about uh, the Yacht, Yacogany? Is that yeah, can, also? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. that's a, a river, that, like river. the Conowingo, that's a border lake yeah. with Pennsylvania. Okay. And on Conowingo, um, there's a reciprocal agreement and Maryland regulations are in effect on Conowingo. Hmm. And in the Maryland portion of the Yacogany, um, Pennsylvania regulations are in effect. Gotcha. What is the deal? So like, like guys, and you guys know from all my, my content now, I kind of transplanted it to Williamsport and I've fished Little Pool and Big Pool before. And Big Pool, I've heard things like the dam broke. And so the DNR doesn't care about it anymore and they're not trying to refill it. It's, it, I want to like, that's a big, it looks like, uh, footprint wise, it was a big body of water. Like, is that what's yeah, the deal with like that? It's like 88 acres. Now, that is technically part of the CNO Canal. Really? So, that's not the big pool itself is, yeah, it's part of the National Park Service CNO Canal. Um, it has a history of sinkholes that develop. Mm -hmm. There's no water control structure on the, the lake. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, you know, the canal flows into it and out of it. And 
I'm not sure what purpose or how it was used in the canal days, but um, it has had over my career a number of different issues with sinkholes where, you know, a good bit of water will drain out. And it's generally uh, because it's it kind of got the the uh, west northwest orientation. It gets a lot of wind there, and it gets stirred up a lot. It's a, a soft bottom lake, so it, the the oxycline is fairly shallow, and there's not a lot of habitat. Um, but yeah, the, most of the water level fluctuations it, it's it has to do with the amount of rainfall we've gotten and whether there are active sinkholes. Is that something where it'd be the CNO Canal would have to be on board to do like some kind of restoration with that thing? To, yeah, to that, yeah, as a landowner, yeah. And then the other part of the canal system near William Williamsport, they've done a great job of, I guess, turning that into, I don't even know if it's like a trout lake or whatever, um, right there, right at Williamsport, where the Conica Jig comes in. Um, right. That area there, I don't know if you guys were involved in that or whatever, but that's fantastic just for bank fishing for for people. That that little stretch of the canal they they right. redid. No, that that's, did you that, guys have again, anything to do with that? No, or? that was the okay. that's a national park service. That's part of the CNO Canal uh, Park there, and that that was restored. And I think they you know they I don't know if they still do. They had a uh, little canal boat rides yep. there, you yep. know that they do there. So and they've restored that area. Uh, you know, in fact, the last couple of years, they've been restoring that and the aqueduct that crosses the Conica Jig. Which is interesting because like you said, that's that you know, I went to Shepherd Shepherd College and that CNO Canal, you know, from Cumberland all the way down, you know, is is all flat. And, and I remember when the Potomac would flood, it would flood over into the canals. Mm -hmm. And so you and we never really fished it much. But mm -hmm. to your point. You know, we always talk too. if you don't have access to a boat, you know, how does a bank angler, we even hear it's like, where do you fish? Well, it's kind of hard to fish some of the rivers unless you get in and wade. But that is interesting to where that can, that provides bank fishing in a smaller little area, you know. No, and, and it's just like, these are why you have these questions. Because when I've been fishing right. that before walking my dog, you hear people yeah. fishing that, oh, the fishing is terrible here. You know, the yeah. DNR doesn't care about it or whatever. And it's just like, you got to ask these questions because like, okay, that's not their jurisdiction. That's not their, yeah. They got and, a lot of so, other water to, yeah, exactly. That's so theirs. It, and that it, does, they can't, they have no jurisdiction. You're, you're, you're barking up yeah. the wrong tree. Right. But again, guys, it's the thing communicate, you know, talk to the canal system, the people that own that. And maybe that's something else. That if you guys want us to do an episode on, we can. Um, the other, last thing I'm talking about was like the Monocacy River uh, mm -hmm. because Jeff Green talks about it a lot. And mm -hmm. until he really started hyping, that sucker up i didn't really understand that at all is that any is that a river that you've had any kind of experience with yeah either? yeah we we uh we have not conducted routine monitoring on the monocacy for many many years um you know and it, it's it got a lot of the same fish assemblage you'd have in the main stem potomac it's got a a good small productive smallmouth fishery um a number of years ago uh around 2009 i think we had some fish kills in there that were similar to what the Shenandoah experienced those same similar mm. kind of issues. Mm. Um, I have not heard of those type of events happening in recent years. Um, but that is one that we, uh, monitor reproduction of smallmouth there annually. Um, that we don't monitor the adult population annually, but typically every three years or so we'll, we have a number of sites on there okay. where we'll monitor that for, uh, adult smallmouth. Um, one of the tools, uh, kind of a new acquisition for us is that primarily we've used on some of the, the streams like the North Branch Potomac because it has some white water on it or is an electrofishing raft. Oh, cool. Hmm. But they, you know, where it's road mm. and, a, and an operator dippers up mm. front and controlling the pedal and collecting the fish. But they, it works really well on smaller rivers. So it's one that we have plans this fall to be monitoring the Monocacy. But yeah, Monocacy is is one of those that uh, it does produce some nice fish and it's got good fishing and it, it's highly popular. Uh, it's There's water trails now that, are, that have established that uh, access points. So there's, really? there's access points for floating, you know, all the way up to Route 77 all the way down. So huh. it's it's very accessible for float trips. That's really cool. I didn't know that at all about that no. place. Another thing I keep thinking about too is just we were talking off air about the um, you know wintertime fishing and how especially for smallmouth or even walleye. I mean a lot of these cold natured fish, uh, you know, fishing up until and again this wasn't until we opened the bait shop that I realized 
uh, December, November, December, January, Fe February is a great time to catch big smallmouth. Then that, then that got to thinking too, we went up to Deep Creek last year. I'd never realized how many ice fishermen are mm. <laughs> frequenting Deep Creek. I mean, it right. is littered literally right. with, with tents out there and people, um, ice fishing, you know, on that lake. Cause that, that climate up there too is, mm -hmm. uh, up in the mountains, very cold anyway. Right. And then when yeah, you get to that winter, premier ice fishing destination. Yeah, is deep I was lake. fascinated by that. And then I, of course I started YouTube and Googling like anybody does. And, <laughs> and there is, there's so much information out there. And we've had some local guys here speaking of that too, you know, Jeremy and some different guys, they would go up, um, you know, go up there to specifically target William, uh, you know, the ice fishing market up there, which is, which yeah. is pretty cool. So a lot of these fisheries are, are year round fisheries, Correct. like you mentioned. Yes. And there was, you know, kind of, uh, you know, a lot of the newer anglers probably don't remember the name, but Butch Ward yeah, oh yeah. from Clear Spring yeah. was kind of okay. the ones that they kept pushing the envelope yeah. later into the fall season and started figuring out how to mm -hmm. catch big smallmouth yeah. later and later into the season. And then it became, you know, this yeah, winter popular. fishing under high water. And, and uh, you know, so that kind of exploded in, mm -hmm. you know, with the hardcore Absolutely. river angling group that, that exploded into, you know, a, a thing to do. And then... Uh, more folks, uh, and that may have been some of the kayak crowds that, you know, realized that you could still catch smallmouth even when the water wasn't high in the wintertime if you located certain winter right. habitats. That's right. So it's kind of evolved. And yeah, like I say cool. fishermen have learned that's right. That, you know, it used to be all oh, after October, the water gets cold, you don't catch smallmouth. Yeah, that's but right. That's some of the best fishing of the that's year. That's right. And, you know, we have such diversity and why the Potomac is so popular is, is, uh, you know, walleye will bite readily in water that's almost mm. that's freezing. I mean, exactly. I've had great days walleye fishing when there's ice floating down, down the river. The river. Um, you know, and they're different than bass. So like, you know, fishermen that want to catch walleye kind of have to learn how to catch mm -hmm. walleye. They're different than bass. Mm -hmm. They're in different, they behave differently. They use different habitats. Mm -hmm. They're more apt to be in current than smallmouth hmm. would be in the wintertime. Basically, the game in the wintertime for smallmouth is mm -hmm. find areas where you don't have current. Correct. But walleyes will still, they still moving and mm -hmm. they're still out in the main flow. Mm -hmm. Maybe not the fastest flow, but they're still mm -hmm. using current areas. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's a little different mm -hmm. approach. Great table fare too. Do you, do you still have, get out to go fishing? I mean, I know you have to run the whole state right now, but like how, how much do you actually get out now? Uh, yeah, I'm out weekly. Yeah, I'm That's out cool. a lot. Yeah, I've been out this with past weekend, and mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I'm, now I I sit by a desk a lot, but uh, <laughs> but, but uh, when you're not, you get out and fish. But I I get out and fish. Yeah, yeah, I love to fish. Still love to fish, and uh, yeah, so I love That's to enjoy cool. the resources that that mm -hmm. we manage. And mm -hmm. like I said earlier, all you know the the biologists that work in our division, um, almost to a one, they're fishermen. And, you know, so they get it, they understand mm -hmm. fishermen, they understand the concerns mm -hmm. and they're out users of the resource. That's cool. That's awesome. That uh, Butch Ward you're talking about, I, I hear that weekly here, his hair jig and people still talk about, they still have his hair jigs. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been dead for, I don't know how long, but, but they still talk about that man and his, you know, hair jig, not just the winter fishing, but like that, that mm -hmm. specific jig. So real quick too, like you talked what I like about each time too, with this is, uh, again, they're a human being. They they love to yeah. fish. And um, Odenkirk talked about, you know, constituents and how you guys do listen to the anglers. So anglers out there that have questions, what what's the best way for them to get in contact? Who do they get in contact? Is it based on that region or body of water? Who should they reach out to if they had questions? Yeah, I mean, you can – I mean, you, I'm always available. Mm -hmm. um, you can reach out to me. You can email. Our email addresses okay. are, are available on our website um if you have a specific question regarding a resource in a particular region when you go to our website you'll see the five regions are color coded and then the appropriate you can click on the link for the appropriate region and you'll see who the regional manager is and their contact information if you have something specific in that area they'd be the best ones they'll, they'll be the most knowledgeable of, of what's available and can point you in the right direction Very good. Awesome. John, I mean, is there anything else? I know we touched on a lot. I would, I, this, you got an open door policy. If there's anything about the state that they want to talk about or get out, you guys have anytime you want to come on. Um, 
it's so funny because when we started this, people told me like no one would want to listen to the DNRs talk. And yet every time I have one on, I'm going to break close to 10,000 views because everyone actually wants to hear what they say. Um, Cause it's just, it's fascinating to just to bring that together of like what people think versus the reality. Yeah. And it's so informative. Cause like when you're talking about the fish kill too, that's one thing Odenkirk, when Kelby and they Kelby, were together, yeah, they the were like, you know, John basically said too, that's not DEQ. Like there's other organizations, the water quality, you know, the water quality type thing is, you know, we're, we're biologists managing the fishery. <laughs> you right. know so but mm -hmm. then then you and we don't think about that we just think about the fish and the water but we don't think about the complexity of of that and Jeff so we'll talk about that for yep. the uh the susquehanna yep. uh water people uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> river keepers thank you yeah. long day yeah but yeah like how important is that we're all and this is a you you keep harping on is that one word the fish like yeah. the tribalism is insane when yeah. i started this when i'm asking somebody to interview and they're like well who are you for like i'm, right. I'm team fly fishing i'm team bass it's right. like i don't i'm about the water yeah and if we would get out of our own ass about that yes. honestly that's and just right. say like we're here to make sure that the river is good we that's won't right. have another shenandoah issue happen that's or, right or that we can all be on the same team that we want to yes. make sure that for generations this thing plays yes and so we shouldn't be fighting each other when no. it's still about the body of water and that resource like you said and the more we can come yeah. together don't don't cause that division amongst us just come together and sit down at a table and i'm just amazed too how often it was the anglers, you know, you're right. They get up in arms over, you know, when fishing's good, it's great. But then when it's not, man, they're looking to you like, what, <laughs> yeah. what did you do to our fish, you know? But how can we bridge those gaps and have those conversations to bring positive change, you know? Um, so I th I'm glad, you know, again, I'm glad you're doing this and glad you're coming on and we can use this as a, as a platform to improve you know the fisheries well, i appreciate the invitation like i said it's a great opportunity for us mm -hmm. to get some of the information on things that we do out to the public mm -hmm. who may not hear it directly yeah and you know there's like i said one thing that we're all working tirelessly yes. to make better fishing 100 we're percent passionate and, about you know it, yeah. and there there are certain things like you alluded to that are within our control and some things that aren't and we still like to have the data and the information right. To at least be able to convey to the anglers this is what's going on right you know yeah. it, it this may be a problem and we can yes. do this but you know we, unfortunately as fisheries managers you know there's a lot of larger picture things Correct. you know with the environment that we can't necessarily Correct. just fix yeah you know that impact our resource well and that smallmouth that just still amazes me how you and you guys are like forward thinking of looking and saying man we haven't seen a good you know recruitment class for x one or a year so I start looking and then then to face failure in your first year but not to quit because you, you may be onto something here let's keep doing this let's keep going back to the drawing board let's make changes you know and you could be really onto something that's mm -hmm. you know yeah. really well, we have we have good you know hatchery staff that are mm -hmm. knowledgeable and mm -hmm. you know they have raised a lot of fish a lot mm -hmm. of bass and again that we don't know why the smallmouth decided to have no interest in spawning once yeah, they went in yeah. the pond we we just don't That's know so weird yeah uh, but they didn't and we can't make them spawn yeah. you yes. know and and you know there's that's typically how bass yeah. there's some probably some new technology developing about you know how you can spawn bass in raceways and that was something that interesting they were looking huh. into but typically you put them in a pond and then they spawn on their own hmm. um so yeah, I mean, mm. they knew it could be done, so, yeah. you know, other, but smallmouth are tricky. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're pickle right. critters, and it's probably why people like them so much. Is yeah. They're, you know, tenacious and yeah, finicky, right. and it's that's just right. the whole part of the package and why people like them, yeah. myself included. Another great podcast. John, thank you so much for coming on. Again, guys, link in the episode good. description, everything below. Please support your DNR, whether you're Maryland, Virginia, PA, West Virginia. Please support these guys. Communication is what's really important mm -hmm. here. The dialogue between the angler and the state. We're trying to make these places better. We're all on the same page. Like and subscribe to the channel. If you're in Winchester, Virginia, stop by Jake's Bait and Tackle. They're the best tackle shop in the area. Please help us continue to grow. Right now on iHeart, we are the number one uh, podcast. And we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Later. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.